Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Restore Tomorrow podcast. We are so excited for our guest today, Dr. Jennifer Degler. Today, we get the privilege of having Dr. Jennifer Degler on the show. Jennifer Degler, PhD, is a licensed clinical psychologist, life coach, speaker, and author. She has led marriage retreats and spoken at women's conferences across the USA, including MomCon, Iron Sharpens Iron for Women, and Hearts at Home conferences. Her books include No More Christian Nice Girl and The Deck of Dares. Jennifer Degler Ministries, LLC, provides professional, practical, biblically sound advice and fun products for improving emotional wellness, relationships, and married sex. She is the host of the podcast, Tip Talk with Dr. Jennifer Degler. She offer, offers a Dare of the Month newsletter, the 324 Club, and the popular DVD, Fan the Flame, Igniting Sexual Intimacy in Marriage. Welcome, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. This is really fun. You all are, I was just, I, really, you all are the cutest couple. And I'm, I've been watching your Instagram reels that you do <laughs> and loving those. So if any of your listeners aren't following you on Instagram, they, they should, because your stories are fun. Uh, oh, I'm so glad you, you did. Kick. They are so much fun to make. Yeah. I, at first we we're like, oh my gosh, this is all a work. Yeah. And then we started making them. We're like, well, we just have fun on here. Yeah. So yes. well, that it was is awesome. A little backstory about just like us. Um, when COVID hit, we were that couple that was like, let's go on TikTok and <laughs> let's like make fun <laughs> videos. Cause it had like, just, we didn't understand it at all. Yeah. And we're like, and we started doing it. We're like, oh my gosh, this is like yeah. really building our connection and intimacy. Like we would spend hours and our creative brains were just yeah. going together and we'd be laughing hysterically. And it was just something to create a lot of fun in the relationship. And then, uh, TikTok kind of just like, I don't know, it just kind of, I felt like it was getting like a little more like promiscuous and not a good way and just not mm -hmm. the best. I was like, I don't really want to be on here anymore. I love doing it as a family, but I don't really like what it stands for. And, and then we saw that Instagram was doing these reels and we're like, oh, we can do this. Like, this would be really fun and let's do it for a nonprofit so that we are educating and giving hope in a new way where we're not just doing dances to do dances, yeah. but they're educational and they're fun and they're hopeful, you know? Yeah. No, I love that. My, my husband and I will do um, once a month, a lot of times we'll do a Facebook live and yeah. we answer sex and marriage and parenting questions. And it's something fun for us to do mm -hmm. together. And he's yeah. not a, he's not a mental health professional and he, he doesn't speak on sex, but boy, he gets in there and he tries to answer those questions yes. and he does a really good job. Mm -hmm. Um, and just giving, you know, a male perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so cool how something outside the bedroom Mm. It's building fun and ministry and, and like you said, you're using, you know, creativity and that that can then spill over into the bedroom. It makes yeah. sexual intimacy better. Yeah. So true. So true. Hey, can we start with just your story? Obviously you have a huge passion for everything you're doing. How did you get there? What was the journey to where you're at today? Well, well Clinton, nobody, I, I, nobody in the sixth grade career day says, I want to be a sex. <laughs> Nobody plans on ending up in this field. Uh, it's just one of those things that circumstances and that God calls you into. And so I was already clinical psychologist yeah. uh, and I was a young mom. I had like a three-year-old and a newborn and I was part of a mops group, a mothers of preschoolers group yeah. at my church. Yeah. And they asked me, for Valentine, the February meeting to speak on sex. And I was like, well, I don't, I don't speak on sex. And they were like, well, you're a psychologist. You know about that. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't. I'm not a sex therapist. I'm a psychologist. And they were like, no, you should speak on that to us. Wow. And I thought, well, if I'm going to prepare a presentation, I'm going to get my own questions answered. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know like, what happened to my libido? I mm -hmm. mean, after I got married and had kids, you know, where did my interest in sex go to and what can I do to keep that sexual fire going as a wife? And in the process of trying to answer those questions for myself, for this presentation, that was the start of this whole ministry. And wow. that was probably 24 years ago. Wow. wow. Yeah. So it just comes out of, you know, a, a lot out of, you know, your mess comes your message out of your pain comes your purpose. Mm -hmm. And so there you go. I wanted to ask if you're open to sharing it. So you're, you're, so the thing you mentioned was libido, which is a big deal, obviously for moms with preschoolers and new kids and 
being married for a while, the relationship gets kind of stale and things like that. Do you mind sharing what other pain points there were in your relationship that you felt like you wanted to get answers to in the beginning? Sure. So I, before I got married, uh, even though I was raised in the church and, you know, I was taught to, to, you know, save sex for marriage, I, I didn't. And I was very curious about sex and um, had several sexual partners before I got married. And then once I got engaged, my libido started going away mm-hmm. and I could not figure out what happened. And particularly mm-hmm. after I got married. And I thought, no, why was I so interested in this before I got married and when it was not something I was supposed to be doing? And then once I got married and that rings on my finger and I now I'm just, my body isn't responsive. And so I wanted to really understand that. And for me, it really boiled down to a couple of things. One was my, um, just my um, taking birth control pills, that that for me was an issue. And so um, that really decreased my libido, but also kind of understanding how I had gotten things kind of backwards in my mind about what really was erotic and exciting and that it, it had to be like illicit for it to be erotic and exciting and had to be premarital sex, not marital sex. And so learning to kind of rewire my brain so that I was drawn to that. And that became a turn on, not just the fact that, Hey, we're sneaking around and doing this. So those are some pain points for me. And then just, you know, I'm 56 now. So now navigating yet another, you know, you never stop navigating things in your sex life. So now navigating through what does it look like, you know, as you have sex through menopause and whatnot. So it never stops. It's an adventure. (laughs) I love that. I've been, um, every time we've been talking about this, your body is a wonderland by what's his name? (laughs) John Mayer. John yeah. Mayer has been like popping in my head. I'm like, man, like, why is he singing about it? And then we should be like having that view of our spouse. Like your body is a wonderland and it's this roadmap and it's adventurous. And there's so many things that your body, you get to be curious about your spouse's body and, and understand um, just, you know, what is that? And where did that come from? And what does this say about you? And what's your history? And there's just so much to your spouse um, that I feel like can be so exciting if we rewire our, our brain that way. Wow. That's good. Renewing your thinking Mm. and for, um, particularly for women, because we do have only a 10th of the testosterone that men do, Mm. you know, we are just not as much in drive sexually. And so our mindset very much controls whether we will enjoy sex, whether we will even let our bodies respond Mm. And we have to, I think as a wife, that's one thing I have to keep working on is like reminding myself, think about sex because I don't naturally do that. Even though I'm in this ministry, I still have to keep, okay, I need to think about this versus maybe for my husband where he's just going to think about it more than I will just based on a hormonal level. Wow. Cause we know that like what you said is that God made the woman's body to enjoy sex. And we have those talks a lot on this podcast of how Mm -hmm. sex is not just for a man. But what I hear you saying is that just because a body is made for sex and it's made to enjoy sex, there might be a lesser drive there. And so you have to go, okay, I'm not going to think about it as much. So I have to engage in that conversation mentally. And there has to be the right headspace that allows you to enjoy sex. Is that what I hear you saying? Yes. Yes. I mean, for the way I look at it after working in this field for, for almost 25 years is that for women in particular, I think women have to work at something I call the sexual fire triangle. And if, if you all were, I don't know, were y'all boy scouts or girl scouts? Did y'all do that? Terry was a girl scout for a little bit. Okay. All right. Well, you may remember the, the fire triangle. Um, which is a safety thing. And there are three things you need to make a real fire. You need fuel, you need oxygen, and you need heat. And if you remove any of those things, then a fire will go out. And so I think for women, women have a sexual fire triangle and we have to tend to these three areas or our fire can go out pretty easily. And the three areas would be um, a sexually healthy, responsive body. And that's a lot of the work that I do is helping 
Christian women understand their bodies and how their bodies work in the bedroom. Cause that's the kind of stuff your mama just doesn't tell you yeah. unless yeah. I'm your mama. Um, <laughs> so, so that's one aspect is, you know, how do you create, how do you make sex feel good in your body? Mm. And then the, another aspect would be that emotional connection between a husband and wife. And that would be like the heat. You know, how do we keep that emotional connection going yeah. and what breaks it? And then the last part, which is what we were just kind of talking about, the oxygen part is healthy biblical attitudes towards sex. Mm-hmm. What are you thinking about sex? What do you believe about sex? Because if a woman has all three of those things working in a healthy way, then she's going to be having the best sex that she can have. Yeah. But if any of those areas get neglected, then she'll see her fire begin to dwindle and even go out. Wow. And so we have to just keep as wives, you know, working on those things because as you yeah. age and as your marriage changes, those particular things change, you know, your body changes, the, co- the connection you have, whether you're in the midst of raising kids or whether you're in an empty nest or, you know, what do you believe about aging, you know, and, yeah. and sex? So we have to keep, we don't ever get to quit working on it. We have to mm-hmm. keep working on it. So let's go back to what you said, because I think it's crazy how you, you shared that you enjoyed sex more when it was outside of covenant, outside of commitment. It was, I mean, maybe a, a committed relationship, but not a marriage. And I've been guilty of that for sure. Coming from my background with pornography and sexually promiscuous behavior that there was such an adrenaline rush about that. There's such a dangerous part about that. That can be a, a real rush. And then when you get married, it can be like, oh, well, this is just, there's no, there's no real danger here. We're just going and having sex in the bedroom and there's nothing that there's, there's none of those attributes to it. But I had no idea that women struggle with that as well. Like, I'm just like, wow, I thought it was only a guy's thing. And so I, I'm curious to find out as you have been in this field for, like you said, 25 plus years, have you seen that that is true for other women as well? Or were you a variant? Were you an, uh, an anomaly? Or is that a common thing for a wife to, for a woman to enjoy it more when it wasn't in the bond of marriage? That's a great question, Clinton. And I think what it's about, what do we, what is happening while you are experiencing sexual pleasure? Mm. Because those things are going to pair together. And we, we, uh, we have a saying in in um, the, the field of, of neuropsychology, which is that neurons that fire together, wire together, mm. right? So if yeah. something is, you know, firing over here, it's like, if you remember Pavlov's dog from Psych 101, where, you know, they would um, feed the dogs and a bell would ring at the same time. And the do- dogs after a while would salivate just when they hear the bell ring sure. because those things were paired. And so for me, pleasure, orgasm was paired with, you know, being in the backseat of a car or hiding downstairs in my boyfriend's basement from his parents or whatever it was. And I think as well, just feeling like I was um, kind of rebelling in a secret way that I kind of enjoyed that as well. And so you're right, Clint, you get married and now all of a sudden you don't have that adrenaline rush and that what you paired it with sexual pleasure comes with that. I'm, that I'm kind of doing something in some way I think is wrong. And I kind of like that. I think it's wrong. And now all of a sudden, okay, married sex is right. Mm -hmm. So now this thing is gone. So learning, learning to, and and it takes experience after experience after experience of good married sex, fun married sex, adventurous married sex Mm. to overlay, like we needed new neural connections. Mm. So it's not like it just happens overnight where we can just be like, oh, okay, well now I think married sex is good. And, and now I'm going to, my body's going to respond to that. Mm. A lot of times it does take just experiencing and creating those new memories, those new neural connections so that your body responds. Wow. Um, and I think as well, un, like unlearning, okay, why, why did I need sex that way? Mm. And what place was broken in me? And what do I need to invite Jesus into? It says in Hebrews, he's able to save to the uttermost. Mm. Some, um, 
that's the King James. The NIV says he's able to save completely, but I love that wording. He's able to save to the uttermost. Mm. And so to me, it has this idea of those uttermost places where you don't even know why you do what you do, Mm. but you can invite Jesus into that and show me like, what do I need to learn and unlearn and then learn so that I can, um, experience sex the way you designed it to be inside of my marriage. Wow. So good, man. I have so many questions. Um, that was amazing. Yeah. I feel like one of them is responding to our bodies, right? So what do you normally recommend? Let's just use my example. Um, let's just use me. So prime example is, uh, before are you trying to get like a free counseling session right now? (laughs) Yeah, why not? Okay, everybody does. Just everybody sure does. Okay. People on airplanes. Comply. Yeah, that's what we're gonna do right now. Basically. I've learned. I don't tell people what I do for a living on <laughs> yeah. airplanes. Yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure you'd have a whole group. Everyone be huddled around, <laughs> yeah. and this is good though. If you ever want free sessions uh, with therapists, you just start a podcast, and then you do what Charity's doing. So, yeah. Go ahead, Charity. Keep going. Keep going. Charity, you go ahead. Okay, so before marriage so sexually broken view of sex is distorted. So my, uh, adrenaline and drive for sex is not there. Um, libido is totally down. Don't even understand healthy sexuality. Don't understand any of that. And then on top of that, you add trauma from a husband who betrayed you sexually, um, with pornography addiction. So how in the world Mm. do you, coach women who now have restored their marriage, right? And they are very passionate about having a restorative marriage. But part of that restoration is engaging in healthy sexual intimacy again. And so what would, where, where do you even start with somebody who's gone through that? It's good. That's a great question. And we start with them really looking at, well, where, where are you running into trouble? Mm-hmm. And whether it's in just the, even the thinking about it, it in that, do you just shut down at that point? You can't even think about it without being, feeling revolted or turned off. Is it that you can begin to like kiss, but then at some point images are intruding yeah. and then that's turning you off. Is there a certain uh, way you may be touching one another or certain sexual activity. And that's when the intrusive thoughts come or when your body begins to shift. And so a lot of times what happens is we don't do a good assessment Mm -hmm. of where are my trouble spots. We're just like, you've ruined it. You've ruined sex for us. It's over. Mm -hmm. And I I just don't even want to do it anymore. Let's just get it. We'll just live like roommates and raise our kids together. Yeah. And because we, we tend to get kind of this black and white thinking, all or nothing thinking of it's just all ruined mm-hmm. when really it's, it's not all ruined. So a good assessment, and this is where, you know, working with a, a counselor or working with a, a coach or whoever it might be to help you understand where, where, where does it, where really are the problem spots for you? And then that helps us come up with an intervention and, um, you know, looking at the fire triangle, usually like you may have all three things going on. Of course, the emotional intimacy has been broken the, you know, by the betrayal. So we need to do some work on in build. How do we build emotional intimacy and trust in that? Maybe we'll also do some work um, in thinking, like thinking all or nothing thoughts, like our sex life is ruined forever and it will never get better. I couldn't, I cannot even imagine that I could ever have sex and not be thinking you're thinking about pornography. Yeah. When in fact, yes, you can, Mm. you know, if you do the work, you can get to a point where that I'm not saying it would never intrude, but that it very, it can very rarely intrude. Mm. And then as well, let's look at your body, what's going on with your body and how your body is responding. Because we do know that for women in particular, your body can armor up Mm. if you don't feel emotionally safe. And you, you can have more sexual pain from sexual activity because you're, you're literally, you don't rec, you're not consciously saying I'm going to tighten up and mm-hmm. armor up, but your body doesn't feel safe. And so there are different things that we can do. So, yeah, I would say that's where it starts charity. 
And just the fact that you're even willing to ask that question is wonderful because that says, I would like to see this change. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So good. That's great. Yeah. I feel like it's really for me, our relationship. Let's just, you know, why not to share it? Just keep right going. on there. Just so, keep going. Yeah. Um, I think for our relationship, after we established safety in the relationship, right, we worked on a lot of recovery, um, have had to rewire our brain on God's view of sex, why he even created us as sexual beings, right? There's been a lot of education and a lot of healing and a lot of praying over our bedroom, inviting God into the bedroom, safety with his sobriety, of course, things like that. Um, I feel like it's con in stages, like where I finally now enjoy sex but personally where I'm at is I feel like my drive, I don't, I don't, I just don't even know if I've even never had a drive. I feel like I'm forcing myself mm. to tell myself that I have a drive. And it's actually been quite funny. We've been reading a, um, a marriage book called Married Sex and it's a great book and we've been reading it. And every time after we read it, I'm like, then I, I feel like I'm like, Ooh, like we should have sex, yeah. you know? So we're going to uh, keep reading this book forever. <laughs> We're just, I'm not going to change books. We're going to read this book till I die. It's going to be great. But I feel like that book has helped in a way, I guess, for me. Um, well, I would just ask that question. Why, why do you think that is? Why is it that when we read a book about sex and it's a biblical based book, so we're doing the triangle, we're emotionally connecting, you know, maybe we're sitting close together. So there's physical connection there. And then like there's the spiritual right thinking. Mm -hmm. Why would that initiate a desire in charity? To want to make love because you're seeing that the most powerful sexual organ you have in your body is your brain mm. wow. and when you have if you have when you have less testosterone and you're more estrogen when you have more estrogen then the brain becomes even more important wow because when you when you have more estrogen it just it makes you it makes you more susceptible to distraction um, you know, probably, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but like Clinton, you know, you, you all could be into it and you're thinking, oh man, charity's really into it. This is going great. And all of a sudden she's like, we need to paint the ceiling. Yeah. Look up. Did you see that? And you're like, what? The heck? what? Yeah. Why are you looking at the water on the ceiling? Yes. Whereas for when, when testosterone is in drive, I mean, the house could be falling down. And, you know, the kids are knocking on the door and, you know, Charity's like, do you hear the kids? He's like, do we have kids? I don't yeah. remember, yep. you know, and it, yeah. So some of this I can, I can all, see the 25 years of experience right there. Uh, it's yes. like, you know, it's like you read, read us like last week's paper. That was there good. There you go. There you go. And so recognizing, okay, that, that it makes a difference. And, the, and so with that estrogen making you more prone to, to distraction and just having more of like, you're just not naturally thinking about sex all the time, but you're reading a book together, wow. which that is one of my most common recommendations for couples is get a, get a Christian sex book and then sit in bed and read it together. Hmm. And it's amazing. I mean, you can have great discussion. You're building emotional connection. You're working on the whole attitude thing. And then because it's like, reminding a woman's body, Hey, mm -hmm. think about sex. And so then all of a sudden we start getting some, you know, some blood flow to the genitals. We start getting some hormones flowing. And then before you know it, she's like, well, you know what, I, now that I kind of think about it, maybe I would like to have sex. And so that's a, that's a great way to keep that fire going. So I love that you guys have hit upon that and you know charity you pointed out a great thing a great point for women is realizing that you don't have to feel like having sex to initiate sex mm -hmm. if you're waiting until you feel really horny as a woman as a wife you may be waiting until jesus comes back <laughs> <laughs> so for a it's lot of charity women, no it would have been it would have been right? jesus coming back for yeah. sure yeah yeah so you just it's like a walk of faith we're assuming you have that healthy, sexually responsive body. So you know, okay, my body, I trust this man enough. I feel emotionally connected to him enough that if we have enough foreplay and I can get all those other windows in my mind to shut down where I'm thinking about 
do we have enough milk and bread for tomorrow? And I left the laundry in the hamper or whatever. Then if I can get all of that shut down, eventually my body catches up. Mm. But what happens so often, and, and listen, this still happens for me. And I teach this stuff is sometimes I'll just, you know, my husband, he would be happy to give me as much foreplay as I want. But sometimes after a little, I lose patience with myself. I'm like, let's just go ahead. Just, let's just go ahead and do it. <laughs> you know, and then I'm not fully excited yet. Mm. And so as a woman, it's learning to say to yourself, I deserve as much sexual pleasure as I can experience. And I am worth this time. Mm. I am worth saying, even though you husband seem really excited and are ready to get to the main event, I'm just going to tell you, you know, I am just, I need to slow down here and I need you to give me a back rub or I need, uh, or, or if he's like already moving on, like, okay, let's get to some oral sex. And you're like, I'm just not ready for that yet. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you need? Do you need your feet rubbed? Do you need, what do you need? Um, and, and getting women to a point where they feel like I am in, I, this is my I can ask for this. I should ask for this Mm. rather than magically think like I do a lot of telepathy in the bedroom Mm. where I think really hard what I want my husband to do Mm. and it never works. Mm. (laughs) But if I open my mouth and I say, I need, you know, touch me lighter or slow down, or we need to back off of this, then I am owning that. Mm. And then we have a much better chance than of my body finally catching up. And me, and then we start having sex. And at some point I'm like, oh, that's right. I do like this. Mm. I, I had forgotten. I do like this. I do like green eggs and ham. Mm. You hit on something that was so powerful. And it's when you're like, I am worth this. Uh, I'm worth having this, you know, pleasure and being cherished and adored. And, you know, I think uh, for a lot of women who have been betrayed, uh, unfortunately, because of the lack of education around mm. sex and, and sexual intimacy and marriage, um, we had, or at least I'm always going to speak from my experience, but I had thought that I could fix Clinton and that whenever, I just didn't want him to look at pornography. So a lot of the times, you know, our language, because we were so, we did not understand God's view of sex. We didn't understand his design for sex. We weren't educated in that. And so we believed these lies of, Charity, if you don't fulfill his sexual desires and needs, then he's going to go elsewhere and look at pornography. And so he would, you know, he would say things that were hurtful and, you know, like um, to this day that, you know, we are constantly rewiring our brain, but he was like, hey, it's been, you know, so, so and so amount of days. And that saying triggers the daylights out of me because I'm like, well, why does it matter how many days it's been, you know, like, but in reality, I, beforehand, I would be like, okay, let's just have sex so that, you know, you can enjoy yourself and then, and then you'll be good and we'll get back to normal. But I never was able to take the time to say that I deserve sex. I am worthy of this pleasure too. I am worth this. Like, you know, adore me, cherish me. It's not just a task. It's not just this thing that we check off the list. It's something that you take your time in and you can enjoy as well. But I had not believed that for a very long time because of the distortion view of sex that we had because of pornography and the world, unfortunately. For a lot of wives that are <clears throat> dealing with a spouse that, that is recovering from a pornography addiction or unwanted sexual behavior, they, we have this idea that if, if I'll just have sex with him enough or sex with her enough, because women can be addicted to pornography and unwanted sexual behaviors as well, then that'll take care of things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's like saying, and you all may have heard this before, that you say to an alcoholic, you know, we just need to make sure you have plenty plenty of beverages to drink. Mm. That's why you're an alcoholic. It's because you're so thirsty. Mm. Well, that's that's not it at all. It's not because they're so thirsty. And if you would just give them lots and lots and lots of Coke and Coca-Cola and lots of Mm -hmm. water, they wouldn't drink alcohol. And it's the same way with sex. And so we can feel, and then that really distorts, like for a wife feeling like, okay, now I'm in control Mm -hmm. of like, I have to give him this 
this thing. I have to do this. Sex becomes something that she does for him Mm -hmm. instead of something that they do for themselves and for the marriage and for each other. And, and then it just, I mean, it will kill your desire. It'll make that flame, the sexual desire triangle, it'll just make it, it'll smother it. And a lot of resentment builds. Yep. Yeah. Because you feel like I'm now the, I am the gatekeeper Mm -hmm. and I like, you're not responsible for controlling your own pornography addiction. Mm -hmm. I am. I have to say, let's have sex. So you don't look at porn. Mm -hmm. And, and that is just a recipe for a lot of unhappiness on both parts. Well, and then I'm not listening to my body either, right? Like I'm not not in tune with my body. I'm not in tune with, yeah, well, I want to have sex too. It's just, okay, well, it's just, it's all about him. And so realizing that like, oh, like my body can respond to, and Mm -hmm. God created me with a design for sex and God created me with a desire and I should enjoy it too. Like (laughs) I had no idea any of that stuff. Like when we were on the journey of recovery, that was one of the most mind-blowing educational stuff that I had learned. I was like, Clint, did you know that God wired me too? And I actually have like, I I can't remember, you probably know how many nerve endings we have, you know, that go off in our, like in our vagina. And, um, I was like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. And you only have like a couple, (laughs) like God designed me too. Yes. Yes. And you know, one of my, one of my very favorite things to talk on is, is when I do fan the flame, a wife's guide to igniting sexual intimacy in marriage, where I go and I speak to, uh, engaged women and married women for, um, about two, two and a half hours and just explain to them about the sexual fire triangle and about their body and how their body works. Mm. And we talk about the clitoris. We talk about the their vagina. We talk about their G spot. And for many women, it's just like, I, I didn't know this mm. again. We don't learn about that. They don't mm-hmm. understand, you know, that the clitoris is, was created just for pleasure. It serves no other purpose. You know, a, a penis is a, is a multi-purpose tool. Um, it is created for pleasure, but it's also created, you know, for urination, for procreation, for writing your name in the snow. <laughs> There's a lot of purposes, Oh yeah, Um, but not so for the clitoris. And so Mm -hmm. women understanding that and how incredible our design is, um, can, I think that can help women understand that God did create sex for them to experience pleasure too. And it's not just about him. And, um, and this is a journey. And so it's exciting Mm -hmm. charity to hear you talking about how you're still working on this. You're still learning. That's so great. So much to learn. (laughs) Okay. My question for you, Jennifer is as a husband. Okay. So this has happened a lot, right? We, we are coming alongside a lot of couples that are our story. And the guy is seeing that his wife is completely disengaged with sex for whatever reason. Maybe there's still trauma. Maybe it's that she wants to. I mean, sometimes we heard the story about they're kissing and there's making out going on and then boom, just dead after that. Like just, I want nothing to do with you. If you even push on anything more than this, um, I'm going to get angry and blow up and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so my question to you is, is what you said is absolutely beautiful. So lovely and so perfect. How can we as the husband create safety? Well, I mean, I guess we know how to create safety, but how do we, from if we have safety in our relationship and we're not acting out and we're, trying to emotionally connect and we are, you know, listening to different podcasts, including yours about the right attitude, the godly attitude. What, what, what's our role in getting our marriage to a healthy sexual experience? If our wife is disengaged in that arena and we don't want to be forceful or angry or manipulative, what can we do as a, as a healthy husband to encourage that being cultivated in our relationship? Oh, that's a great question. And, you know, Clinton, the body doesn't lie. Mm. We can lie with our brains mm. and say, I trust my husband. I trust my wife. But the body will tell the truth. Mm. And if what your spouse is experiencing is that I trust you with kissing you, maybe I trust you with caressing you, but there's a point at which it just, I can't, I don't, my body says, don't trust. Wow. And it all shuts down. And I think that's what you're describing. Yeah. Yeah. 
and the frustration you feel as the um, offending spouse that you're doing everything you can and yet your your spouse gets stuck at this one point. And so patience is required. This process um, takes so much longer than people think it will. Um, and you know, in, in terms of doing work with infidelity, like couples counseling work, as couples work through infidelity, um, it usually takes on average two to five years for a couple to recover from an affair. And that is assuming they are working, working, working at it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Two to five years. Yep. That is a long time. Mm-hmm. And I tell my couples, you know, sex is the first thing to go bad and it's the last thing to get good. Mm-hmm. And because it is the most intimate knowing that you can have of another person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so understanding and like if there's the point at which you shut down Mm. then I would say in that moment when that happens and they're like leave me alone Mm. I I just I can't even talk about this in that moment what don't push them to talk then Mm. because they're probably flooded they're probably overwhelmed with intrusive thoughts or intrusive images their body is probably armoring up um and in that moment, it can help if ahead of time, you will talk to your spouse and say, okay, I've noticed this is kind of the pattern. Yeah. What do you think would feel good to you when that happens? Would yeah. you like to sit in my lap? Would you like to just lay together? Mm-hmm. Would you um, prefer I rub your feet? Mm-hmm. Would you rather me give you a little time alone? Um, what would feel good to you? Yeah. So that you can be supportive of them, but in a way that they want to be supportive and that you understand that this is okay. I mean, it's just like, we're moving. We, we've gotten to the, used to be, we couldn't kiss. Now we can kiss mm-hmm. and now we can French kiss. Mm-hmm. Maybe now we can do a little petting, mm-hmm. but we, but again, we're just, we're getting there slowly. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then as well to see, okay, is that the kind of thing where maybe Maybe she needs to go talk to a professional mm. um, and get some more techniques for what do you do when those intrusive thoughts come? Yeah. Maybe there is trauma. And, um, you know, I, ha- I can remember I had um, worked with a lady that, and I would just tell people, if, you're, if, you're, if the offending spouse has videotapes or video recordings of them having sex with other people, do not watch them because it's traumatizing. Mm. And she unfortunately had run across some stuff on, on her husband's um, computer and she watched it Mm. and watched a lot of it. And it, it traumatized her. And so we had to do specific, you know, trauma work on, we did some, you know, doing EMDR and some other techniques over that experience, because that for her was what was coming up. Yeah. Um, So if you get, if you get real stuck there, you know, invest some, some time and some money and some energy yeah. into seeing a professional because you may need some professional help to get you past that block. Absolutely. Gosh, that's so good. That was really good. And I think all of us guys need to hear that. Mm-hmm. Just the patience with the process and just going, okay, how can I make you feel safe right now? And asking, what would you enjoy? I'll never forget charity. That was such a weird question to ask charity. Like, Hey, what do you like? And because we're just trained with our society telling us we should know what the other person mm-hmm. likes and you should know what I like. So just do it. Like, what do you like? I don't know. Just, just do it. You know, do what I like. Well, I'm asking you, what do you like? And you don't even know. And so I love that because you painted a picture of a couple that's like, Hey, it's okay not to know. And it's okay as, as a guy to, it's not, it doesn't mean that we are not adequate. It doesn't mean that, that we are an inexperienced it actually is proper and, and better for us to go to our wives and say, hey, what do you enjoy? What would you like during these different phases, whether it is foreplay or it's during intercourse, all these different things so that she can get in touch with what she enjoys and what she likes. And that's been well, a journey for us. Yeah. And Clinton, just to also just to follow up and say, if when I'm saying, you know, what is it that, that you like? I, that I'm saying if when she shuts down, yeah. Yeah. asking her what would be helpful because 
something sexual is not going to be helpful at that sure, point. Of course. Yeah. And, okay. um, but so many times women sexually, we don't know what we like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lots of times we know more what we don't like than what we do like. Mm -hmm. And so that's why us taking time to like, say, well, try doing this to me. We'll try doing that. Well, let me try and see. And the thing about a woman is, I mean, it changes mm -hmm. from day to day because your body, I mean, she might enjoy some kind of, you know, breast play earlier in the month. And then the, the two weeks before her period, when mm -hmm. progesterone is rising and your breasts typically get like really tender, it can be like, don't touch them, don't come near them. They hurt. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, you know, it keeps men on their toes. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's good. You know? <laughs> um, no, you can't get complacent. But again, a lot of communication and talking and most, I'm amazed at couples that have been married 50, 60 years, and they've never really ever had a conversation about sex. Yeah. Yeah. It's been mainly nudges and that's about it. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, the, the, the happiest marriages are where couples are best friends mm. and best friends talk, best, best friends communicate. It's true. But it, it does mean that a wife has to do some work on her own to figure out what does feel good to her. And that it is okay for her. It's a, it's, she should feel good. That's, yeah. that's yeah. how God created her body. I love that. Cause you're allowing a wife to have a voice in the bedroom mm. and she probably has not had a voice in the bedroom maybe at all or ever. And uh, maybe once, you know, or, but I just think how beneficial that is and, um, just having them come together. And I, I just think it's a very sweet time. And, um, I am excited for those that are listening. I pray that you just start the journey um, because it is not going to be easy. There probably will end up being nights where you are crying, you know, but cry together, grieve together. And instead of getting frustrated, enjoy the process yeah. and yeah. have patience and grace for your spouse. And um, like Jennifer is saying, it's going to just going to take time, but you'll get there, you know, mm, if you are working on your own journey. So, oh my goodness, Jennifer, this has been amazing. I just feel so blessed uh, by yeah. everything that you have shared. We took so many notes and you just shared so many amazing golden nuggets. Thank you so much. I would love uh, for our listeners who maybe don't know um, where to go to get more information on everything that you said, because you said so many incredible things. Where can our listeners go to find out more about what you do and what you offer? So they can go to jenniferdegler.com, typical spelling of Jennifer, and then D-E-G-L-E-R.com. My, my ministry to help Christian wives with their sex lives is actually C-Wives, C-W-I-V-E-S. And you can go to cwives.com. They all, it all goes to the same um, website and they, they can check out the fan, the flame. If they want to get the online, uh, can view online on the fan, the flame thing. That's a fun thing to watch as a couple. Um, and, uh, I'm not responsible for any babies that may be born <laughs> as a result. <laughs> I I've been doing this long enough that I have people that come up to me and they'll have a baby and they'll go, this is my fan, the flame baby, <laughs> which is so fun. So if they that let me, I, I take a picture of their baby and do a hashtag fan, the flame baby. Oh, you know, so cute. Which is so, which is, which is so fun. And then free, we offer the dare of the month. They can sign up for the sea wives dare of the month. And we will email um, the wife a dare to help her initiate a creative sexual encounter with her husband. And it's just something fun um, and it helps wives. Like we were talking about charity. We don't think about sex a lot. So it makes us kind of think about sex because we think mm -hmm. about this fun little thing we're going to do with our husband. Um, it's nothing nasty. It's something cute. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it helps get our motor running as a wife and um, getting thinking about, okay, how can this be fun for me? Mm -hmm. And usually more pleasure and more emotional connection and a better attitude about sex comes from doing that. Um, so they can sign up for the free dare of the month and we'll email them a dare once a month. Mm. I love that. So pure. Jennifer, thank you so much for all the wisdom you shared and just for spending your time with us on the Restored to More podcast. We are so grateful. Well, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing.